time, we started talking about flatworms, right? And so we, we talked about flatworms, and we said that they have the three cell layers. They have bilateral symmetry. They have a gastrovascular cavity. Um, and then we talked about uh, how, like, the different kinds of parasitic roundworms, or sorry, flatworms. Um, and today we're going to talk about roundworms and annelids, okay? So roundworms are in phylum nematoda. Okay, so these are called nematode worms, and they ha also have bilateral symmetry. Okay, oh, yeah, they have bilateral symmetry. They also have three cell layers. Okay, um, the ectoderm, the endoderm, and the mesoderm, okay, just like the flatworm. But something that roundworms have that flatworms do not have is this thing that's called a pseudocelum. Okay. And a pseudocelum is basically a fluid-filled space between the mesoderm and the internal organs. So, if you look at the picture, okay, the ectoderm is the outermost layer, okay, the mesoderm is, would be here, okay, and then the purple right here, that's the endoderm. A pseudocelum is this, see this light blue line? This represents the pseudocelum. This would be full of fluid okay, in between the mesoderm and the endoderm, okay? So it's a fluid-filled cavity in between the internal organs and the, um, the mesoderm. So basically what happens is this. Egg and sperm fertilize the egg. Okay, that little egg then starts to grow and divide and becomes like a little embryo. Okay, in that embryo you have three cell layers, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, the endoderm. Okay, the ectoderm develops and becomes the skin. The mesoderm develops and becomes like the muscles of the animal and then the endoderm develops into the internal organs, okay? So in things like roundworms, um, in between these internal organs and the muscle of their body wall, they've got a fluid-filled space. Does that make sense? So there's a space in between their mesoderm, their muscles of the body wall, and their internal organs, like their digestive tract. Does that make sense? Okay. And um, so they have a pseudocelum, which is not quite a full, like, true coelom, and annelids actually have a true coelom, and we'll talk about what the difference is between the two. Um, and then we'll talk about why it's so important that you have a fluid-filled space in between your body wall and your internal organs. But roundworms are the first ones that we've seen that have a pseudocelum or any sort of fluid-filled space between the mesoderm and the endoderm. This is also the first phylum that we've seen that um, the animals have a complete digestive tract. Okay, so one-way digestive tract. Um, and if you look on, so go to the first page of your notes, at the very bottom, okay, number two, it says um, one-way digestive system. That should be two-way digestive system. Sorry, I made a mistake on the slide. So it should be a two-way digestive system in the bottom at number two, okay? So where it says flatworms, number two at the bottom, two-way digestive oh. tract, okay? But roundworms have a complete one-way digestive tract. That means food comes in one way and it travels through one way and then exits out the other end, okay? Whereas in all of the other animals that we've seen, like Cnidarians, okay, food comes in one way, gets digested, and then waste passes out the same way, right? So waste, stuff goes in two ways in the same opening. Here, um, one way, right? So you can eat something and it can be traveling through your digestive system, um, and then you can eat something else because it'll pass through and go out the other way, and you don't have to worry about blocking and um, blocking your mouth where the waste products would come out, okay? So, uh, they do have a complete one-way digestive tract. Roundworms can be microscopic, so teeny, teeny, tiny, up to one meter long. So 3.3 feet is a meter, so you can have roundworms that are like this big. It's crazy. They're huge. It's gross. They're, they're not going to be super fat, but they're going to they're gonna be super long. Okay. Um, and roundworms can exist pretty much everywhere. Most of them are found in the soil, but you also find some uh, in the ocean, and particularly um, between the grains of sand, like on sandy shores and beaches and stuff. So they, uh, they do, are found pretty much everywhere in the world. Most of them are free living, meaning they're traveling around, moving around, finding their own food, but you do have some kinds that are parasitic, 
Um, and we'll talk about some of the parasitic kinds today because they can actually cause some pretty horrific diseases in humans. Um, so we'll talk about we'll talk about a few. Um, and they can be parasites and stuff in like whales and stuff like that too. Okay. Um, we're not going to actually look at any of the classes of roundworms. We're just simply going to use Ascaris, which is actually a um, parasitic roundworm, as our model nematode. All right, so let's look at how nematode worms actually carry out the seven essential functions. Okay, so how do they digest food? Well, they have a complete one-way digestive system. So food enters in the mouth, travels through like the pharynx into the stomach, where it gets broken down, into the gut, or sorry, the intestine, where it gets absorbed, and then any waste products pass out the other end through the anus. Okay, so one-way digestive tract. This is definitely not a gastrovascular cavity, right? It's a complete digestive system at this point. And you can see here. And on here, you can also see the pseudocelum, right? So here's the gut, right? And then here's the body wall up here. And there's all everywhere that's in green on that picture, that's the pseudocelum. So that's the fluid-filled space. Okay, so it's full of fluid. All right. Okay, their respiratory and circulatory system, they don't have them, okay? Um, they don't have an organized system for respiration to get oxygen, and they do not have an organized system for circulation, for circulation either. Um, they can still simply rely on diffusion. Okay, so oxygen will diffuse through their ectoderm um, in, and carbon dioxide will diffuse out. And they are small enough, thin enough that they can rely on diffusion and they don't need a circulatory system to transport anything around. Okay. They can get big, but they're still thin enough, the cells are, and they're still thin enough that they can rely on diffusion. Um, a lot of the worms, especially the parasitic worms, have this thing called a cuticle on the outside of their body, and that cuticle is actually like this hard, tough protein outer covering, um, and it helps for those worms to be able to survive in some pretty harsh environments. Um, it, it protects them. And just to give you an idea of like how much it can actually protect them, there's some kinds of worms, parasitic roundworms, that you could take them and stick them in straight vinegar and they could survive because of this cuticle. Um, so they can live in pretty acidic environments. Um, so they would be hard to kill, right? So that cuticle um, protects them and covers their outer, outer layer. And the cuticle is tough and they actually have to um, like kind of molt that cuticle in order to grow. So they'll have to like get rid of the cuticle, grow, and then grow a new cuticle. So hard outer covering to help to protect them. Some of the parasitic flatworms have it as well. Um, their excretory system. So they've got uh, excretory canals with two pores that they will use to get rid of any sort of waste products and that is up near their anterior end. Any sort of like ammonia and stuff that they would produce naturally by doing the natural things that cells do can diffuse out of their ectoderm through their skin. Um, and then any sort of like water balance that they need to maintain will be maintained with these excretory pores. Okay, So they'll, if they have excess water that's getting in their body, they'll filter it out and get rid of it through these excretory pores. Okay, um, So here's the excretory pore up here, right? So, and then these are the excretory canals. Um, and so they'll filter their body fluid. So see the pseudocelin that's filled with fluid? They'll actually filter that body fluid and then any excess waste comes out through the excretory pores. All right? Um, their nervous system. So they do have a head and they do have a brain and they have a dorsal and a ventral nerve cord. Um, do you remember what dorsal means? Yeah, like the top, like the back. What's ventral? Bottom, right, or the belly. So their brain is actually circular, and it's a circle around their pharynx, okay? Um, and then they've got a dorsal nerve cord that runs down their back, and then they've got a ventral one that runs down their belly, okay? Um, they don't really have eyes, okay, or anything like that. Um, particularly, like, the parasitic ones, they don't need it. But... Um, they do have a dorsal nerve cord and a brain, and they will use those to respond to their environment. 
their musculoskeletal system, they only have longitudinal muscles. So that means that the muscles run from like the mouth down the body towards the tail. So the muscles extend this way. When a muscle contracts, what happens to it? They get shorter, right? So if you take your worm and the muscles are running this way, when those muscles contract, they get shorter, right? And then if they extend those muscles, they get longer again. Contract, get shorter, right? And so as they contract and extend these muscles, they move, okay? So they're swimming around. Yeah, so they kind of like, they, they're, they're normal size. They contract and pull their tail up, right? And then extend and push their head forward, contract and pull their tail up, <laughs> and <laughs> go forward. Okay, reproductive system. Um, they do sexual reproduction, so only. They don't do asexual reproduction. And they do have male and female. So there will be male worms and female worms. The females are typically larger than the males because it takes more energy and it's harder to produce eggs. And so they need to be larger in order to be able to store those eggs and um, save up enough energy to make them. Um, and then they will actually copulate. So the male has a copulatory spicule that he will use to pass the sperm to the female. She'll take it and put fertilize her eggs and then release her eggs okay, and the new generation of uh, roundworms is born. All right, so we do sexual reproduction. Okay, so the free-living flatworms and roundworms, they're very ecologically important, but um, some of the parasitic ones are kind of fun to talk about because they cause some pretty crazy things. Um, but one of the main things that particularly nematode worms are going to do are they're going to be um, an important step in the food chain. So we actually have these things that are called myofaunal nematodes. Okay, so if you think of like a grain of sand, okay, um, if you take two grains of sand and think of them like next to each other, there are little round worms that live in between the grains of sand. Okay, so our little worm would live right in between those two grains of sand. Uh, anything that lives between the grains of sand is called myofaunal. Okay, and so you have these little myofaunal nematode worms live between the grains of sand, go around eating like detritus and stuff like that. And then there are other kinds of things like crabs that will go through and actually eat the dirt, okay, eat the sand on the shore, and they'll digest the round worms and then poop out the sand. So they actually help to like take all of the food uh, and energy that's available in the detritus and pass it up the food chain. So. They are important in the food chain. But let's talk about some of the parasites and what they could actually do to you, because that's kind of interesting. So we talked about flatworm parasites last time, right? The flukes and the tapeworms, okay? Um, roundworm parasites, there's a lot, okay? A lot of them. Ascaris is like a fluke or a tapeworm, okay? So it gets into your intestines and it attaches and so soaks up nutrients and stuff from your intestines. It's um, a little bit gross because it can actually move through your body. So like when it's ready, <laughs> when it's ready to, um, to as in its larval stage, it can actually like move around and it'll go up into your lungs and spend part of its time in your lungs. And then, no, and then um, it'll actually, when it's ready to reproduce, crawl up your, your trachea to the back of your throat where you will swallow it again. And it will, no, it's small. You'll swallow it again, and it'll go back into your intestines and then um, reproduce, and then you poop out the fertilized egg. Yeah, lovely, pleasant, right? Mm -mm. Um, and it can cause all sorts of problems because the females will look for the males, and they don't have eyes or anything like that, so they kind of do it by touch. And apparently your bile duct that empties your bile into your intestines apparently feels like a male to them. So a lot of times they actually congregate right there and they end up blocking your bile ducts and can cause all sorts of problems for you. So, gross. <laughs> That's the scariest. Um, hookworm is a little bit more sinister than just a normal like worm. They um, actually, they live in your intestines but they actually burrow through your intestinal wall and feed on your blood supply. So they'll actually like make little sores in your intestinal wall and you have lots of bacteria that live in your intestines and so they can actually cause you to get like these infections, big infections in your intestine um, from this worm because they're opening up your intestinal wall. Um, filarial worms cause elephantitis, 
Do you know what elephantitis is? Okay. Um, elephantitis is like you swell up really big. So here, let me find a picture for you. Yeah, well, I'm going to... Yeah, um, yeah, because it happens there quite a bit, actually. So here's what happens in elephantitis, okay? Uh, so you know how, um, how, how many of you have ever been on, like, a plane for a long period of time because you're flying somewhere and then your ankles swell? Yeah. Okay, basically what happens is when you sit for a long time, um, your, your blood has fluid in it, right? Um, and in the capillaries, the, the capillaries are not very, like, close together, okay? So capillaries are actually, like, they have little holes in it. Not big enough for the red blood cells to go through, but big enough for, like, the fluid that's in your blood to go through. So as you sit there, um, some of the fluid leaks from your blood vessels into the surrounding tissue. And one of the things that kind of, like, helps to get that fluid back up to your heart to be dumped back into the blood is movement of your muscles. So but when you sit there for a long period of time and you don't move, that fluid accumulates, okay? What happens is uh, that fluid can get put back into lymph vessels, and then those lymph vessels go back up to your heart, and it gets dumped back. All that fluid gets dumped back into your, into your um, blood stream. These worms block those lymph vessels. Okay, so they get into the lymph vessels and they block the lymph vessels so that fluid can't ever make it back up to get dumped back into your, to your bloodstream and so it accumulates in your um, appendages and does stuff like that. Okay, so it causes you to swell up really big and yeah, it's not pleasant. What? It's not blisters. These are actually, this is like, um, like folds of skin that are just full of like... It's, it's not going to be super squishy. Um, it's going to be more like um, actually pretty firm, right? Because the it's fluid, but it's like all in, in your tissues. And so you've got like all of your protein fibers and the actual cells of your anti-parasitic drug. No, no, I wouldn't just strain out. So because it's, it's all the fluid is in between the cells of your of your body. Yeah, it would just bleed. Yeah. It would be bad. Anyways, so filarial worms will cause that. Um, guinea worms, we're going to skip trichinella. Guinea worms actually like, so they get in by like a bite from a fly or a mosquito. And so they'll get in and then when they're ready to reproduce, they actually come to the surface of your skin and form like blister boil things on your skin. You see a worm and yeah, it's gross. Um, yeah, you can see the, the little worm. Eye worms are just what they sound like. They're worms that actually get into your eye. Um, yeah, and you can, yeah, you can see them like in your eye and you can actually see them like going across. There's stories of like ones moving from one eye across the bridge of the nose to like the other eye. So, it's, well, they, you have to get it surgically. It's like in the actual eye, so it's not just like on, yeah, it's like in your eye. Yeah, I can show you a question. If you don't want to see, then look away. <laughs> they would be parasites on different kinds of mammals. So, uh, I were... Okay, I'm trying to find them. Okay, if you don't want to see this, look away now. Okay, so there's the worm. Okay, that's a really nasty looking one. Yeah, well, you can see it like in there or like here. They just move around in your eyeball, yeah. It's pretty gross. You would have to get it removed, yeah. So the doctor would come and actually kind of slice that open and then pull out that worm. So. But, I mean, the good news is they tend to not cause blindness, so that's good. <laughs> tend to. Yeah. So, anyways, those are the parasites. Parasitic roundworms. 
Okay, annelids, phylum Annelida. Um, annelids get 